Hello, I'm Gary Stearman. Today, we're going to talk about the language of the New Testament. And with us today is Brent Miller Sr. And he's done a great work. I want you to sample some of the work that he's done on video as he talks about a particular word in the New Testament. And then we're going to come back and have a great conversation with him. When Jesus spoke, he spoke in the common man's language, Conan Greek which is a very precise and elegant language. English, on the other hand, is a very imprecise language. We now have over 450 translations in English that have subtle changes with each other. These subtle changes create discrepancies which create division among Christians. So how do you solve the problem? What if we could go back to translate the entire New Testament and understood it exactly the way the early Christian church understood it 2,000 years ago. Only recently, with breakthroughs in a monadic hermeneutics-based translation, have we been able to accomplish translating the entire New Testament in just over 20 years. It opens up your eyes to the true nature of God. For example, in Greek, we have four words for love. There is the physical love, there is a brotherly love, there is a perfect God love, pure and holy. And then there's the bonding of a mother with a child. In English, all these words are translated into a single word, love. But in the original language, there are four very precise words. So if you look at John at chapter 21, where Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me? And Peter's response is, yes, Lord, I love you. In English, we see the same word. In Greek, Jesus is asking Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unselfishly? Peter's response is, I love you, but the word he uses is phileo, I have brotherly love for you. So in the end, because Peter could not raise himself up to God's standard, God love, Jesus came down to Peter's level and says, do you love me? But in the third question to Peter, it was, do you phileo me? So of course, Peter responds, yes, Lord, I phileo you. So why is it that Peter couldn't agape love Jesus? You'll remember that previously, before Jesus' crucifixion, Peter denied Christ three times. So Peter realizes how flawed he is, showing us that God comes down to our level where we are at to save us. If you read your English Bible, reading that passage, you will see the word love six times. But you will have lost the meaning, the depth that Christ is trying to show you. The pure word shows you every single original definition in the translation and what God fully intended. Receive the full meaning and blessing that Christ always meant for us to have. How about that? Wow, wasn't that wonderful? And here he is, the man himself, Brent Miller Sr., in studio here at Prophecy Watchers. Good to have you back, Brent. Thank you, Gary. It's a pleasure to be back. As you'll remember, approximately one year ago, you introduced the pure word to the world. Mm -hmm. And since then, the pure word has spread to every continent on the planet, um, except Antarctica. Uh, it has covered over 144 countries and territories. Mm -hmm. It is spreading at a phenomenal rate and which we can only contribute as a work of God. God is opening the doors to have this word spread. Um, uh, for those who are not familiar with the pure word, we started a massive project approximately 25 years ago where we would take each of the 5,624 Greek root words, 
to find and determine the original meaning of each of those words as used 2,000 years ago at the time of Christ and the apostles so that we could create a translation that was as close to the understanding of the people 2,000 years ago as humanly possible and have that translation in English format. And what you've done in translating, you haven't translated style or diction or a beautiful sounding rolls off the tongue language, but but your translation was done to get the exact meaning even if, and by the way I'm holding a copy of the pure word here and I've been through this uh, many times in many places myself, and when you first read it you say, wow, this is just like, almost like as if you were translating the Bible yourself. It's a sort of a do-it-yourself translation. And it's not stylistic, but it, but it's done for the purpose of getting exact meanings, which uh, is a, a concept that I don't think anybody's ever tried before. Yeah, that, that is absolutely correct. The intent was for absolute accuracy, bringing the reader back to the original intent and definition of 2,000 years ago. Greek, but, but Greek is a very complex language. And here's where the difficulty arises. English by Greek standards is a very simple language. So to translate Greek, a very complex language with uh, complex parsings for each word, Mm -hmm. into a very simple language like English, there is, it is impossible to do a one word for one word translation. And in fact, anyone who tries to do a translation strips out much of the underlying meaning and definition, which is subtle and hidden, but Mm -hmm. sometimes those subtle changes changes the entire meaning and definition of the verse, what is trying to be conveyed. So when you read the pure word, um, it is truly a, what we feel is a work of God, Mm -hmm. a 20 plus year work of God transferring the original um, parsings of each of the 140,000 words to their English counterparts making it readable exactly as a, uh, the early church would read it. But when you read it, sometimes sentences do not make sense because they do not follow grammatically correct English. And that is where you are correct. The intent was accuracy, not poetry. If we would have taken that next step, the last step in the process, and taken each of the 1,700 plus verses in the New Testament and massaged them, we might unintentionally alter the meaning. That is not the intent. So we stopped at the raw definition. But um, reading the verses is clear. You can read this as a translation or you can read it alongside as a tool with your favorite version of your Bible mm-hmm. and for a greater depth of meaning, you know, open up the pure word and see what it says to amplify the meaning. Well, here's my reaction. Uh, I studied Shakespeare in college and Then I read the King James Bible, and I noticed, you know, there's a a, a concordance there between Shakespeare and 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 the King James Bible. The the style they have, the King James has a very flowery, beautiful style, almost poetic in some ways. Then we come down to the modern language versions, and they're just they tell it like it is. But then you go one step further, and I'm going to read John 3:16 in the pure word because God has loved in such a manner. Uh, the Satan's world so that he gave his son, his only begotten, risen Christ in order that whoever is continuously by his choice committing for the result and purpose of him uh, should not perish but definitely should by his choice be continuously having eternal life. And that's certainly not poetic. No. It does not roll off the tongue like the King James for example. But on the other hand, it gives you a lot to think about. Right. It, it really does. And in fact, um, let me point out one word in John 3.16, a key critical word in John 3.16. It's the word committing by your choice. God will not force you to go to heaven. You mm. must choose to follow mm-hmm. him. And the word committing, people will wonder where the word believe is. John mm-hmm. 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. The King James Version. So where's the word believe? In 
part of the process is to take each of the individual words, go back 2,000 years ago, and what it really meant to the v person who is listening, to the, to the um, person who scribed it, which is, of course, ultimately the Holy Ghost, but the apostles would write down the text. What was meant when King James wrote the word believe was correct. William Tyndall in 1526 first translated the word believe, but the word believe back then was an action verb to commit your life to, to give your life for, mm. or dedicate your life. Mm -hmm. It was an action verb which required an action to commit your life for. People would die for what they believed. So when uh, Tyndall used that word belief, which was then ultimately put in the King James, it was the correct verb. Mm. But today, the word belief has a dozen different meanings. The average person mm -hmm. will understand the word belief to mean I have an agreement with. Mm -hmm. It's not an action verb, nor do I have to commit mm -hmm. my life to it, I just agree with it. That's not the original translation. You must, so the closest mm -hmm. English word we have to that concept is to commit. Commit. Correct. You know, I'm thinking here, you talk to somebody and, uh, and, and at the end of what you say, they look at you and they say, well, I believe so, yeah. Well, what's that person saying? He's a skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's not committed to anything. <laughs> He's still on the fence. <laughs> but in the Bible, believe yeah. definitely implies commitment. Yes. And you've got that in the right. text. Yes. So... And the whole, imagine the whole New Testament, and which is what the pure word is, and reading every verse with that kind of depth of understanding. Again, it's not poetic, but the, but you're striving for meaning, right? Uh, which is amazing. Right. We 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 all know that our pastors of the churches we go to, in order to give us greater insight, they will open up a Greek concordance and they will study individual Greek words. And they will share with us the meaning of those Greek words in the passage. And it opens up our eyes to a, a much more in-depth meaning of what that particular verse yeah. says. But can you imagine having that done for every single verse with a single definition for the entire New Testament? 140,745 words wow. um, uh, based on the Textus Receptus, the text that the King James scholars set aside as the inherent Word of God. And it, it is amazing. It is available to everyone. Again, we're talking with Brent Miller Sr., who has supervised a, a, a massive work resulting in something brand new. Uh, let's go to Revelation. I know you wanted to talk about Revelation 13, 15. Yes. And you've got a lot of examples of what you've done in that particular verse. We are continuously conducting research in ancient anthropology and translation in the pure word to try to come up with a much more in-depth meaning to actually show the world the underlying true intent of some of these very obscure verses. And we came across Revelation 13, 15. And in our studying of that verse, it actually terrified us because we realized what this means, if we were correct, and we believe we are correct when you look at the original Greek, that we are much, much closer to the return of Christ than we ever thought in the final mm. seven years. Let me read from the pure word, Revelation thirteen fifteen. And it was made given to him to give a spirit to the image of the wild beast, that then the image might utter and might cause those whoever might not have worshipped the image of the wild beast that they should be killed. On the surface, it seems a little poetic, but this is precisely the language that John used. Now, that sentence in itself doesn't mean much to us, but if we go and even look deeper into mm -hmm. some of the key Greek words that John used and why he used those words, it makes sense. John is referring to an entire system being developed, and he does it all in a single sentence. We note that the first word of four key words, spirit, will cover spirit, image, utter, and worshiped. Mm -hmm. The first word spirit has many references, but in this case, a spirit is referring to a rational soul, not an actual mm -hmm. spirit. A soul is mind, emotion, and will. 
So in other words, we might think of that as intelligence or in today's vernacular, a human type of intelligence which could be artificial intelligence or sophisticated AI computer program. Now this is very interesting and I, I want to just try to clarify a bit because I'm looking at my King James uh, speaking of the Antichrist, 1315 in Revelation, yeah. it says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Right. Well, the word there is life. Right. But really... It's not living. It's, it's not really. It's not real. Because that particular word is spirit referring to mind, emotion, will. In other words, an intellectual process. He gave an intellectual process to what? The next word, image. And this is the key part. One of the key parts. An image refers to a likeness. Now, in the past, if you were to read the King James Version, um, a lot of people believe that a statue or representation of the Antichrist was created and was given life and could speak. Mm -hmm. But let's go further to see what it really means. Okay. This artificial intelligence was given an image. Now this image refers to a likeness or a form or a substance. It doesn't have to be physical. But in this case we believe it is physical because of the manner in which he refers to it as. Hmm. He's referring to it as a thing. Hmm. Now many people like I said believe this could be an antichrist uh, statue. But what we believe that John is referring to because he's referring to an entire system is that this mechanism or device gives people a visual communication which connects to the system. You'll see why uh -huh. in the next two words. Okay. Um, the third, and this is the most significant Greek word, it's to utter, which is strong number 2980, if you want to look that up. There are, in Greek, there, in New Testament, there are 12 Greek words that are used to express oral communication. This particular word was chosen by John for a reason, to utter. Strong number 2980. This means of communication is interesting because it is to communicate something and at the same time it is impossible for either the listener or the speaker to understand. Hmm. So of all 12 forms of communication, the person can't comprehend this type of form of communication. And guess what? Note this. It's the image that is doing the communicating, the device. And the physical thing is doing the communicating and is communicating to what the system, and it tells us later what the system does, in a language that we can't comprehend. So you're, you're not talking about uh, some carved marble statue or something. Mm -hmm. you're, you're talking about something that, that has power, it has motion, it has energy, it's doing something. It's doing something and it has an artificial intelligence associated with it. Now this is clearly different from what people think when they read the King James Version where yeah. it says that this image will speak. Yes. In fact, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So this image of the beast, when you place this in the context of the 21st century, uh, we're looking at something highly technical. Yeah, this, this form of communication in the 21st century could be seen as it is definitely a form that humans can't comprehend and what can't we comprehend? The communication of computer codes being transferred uh, with encrypted data and semaphores. Um, so this word utter is a key word that John uses. Of all the 12 he could use, he uses this particular word. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to the last word for worship. In this case it means to have unquestioning allegiance to. It doesn't mean to get on your knees and to bow down such as to a statute. It means you're using this system which connects you with unquestioning allegiance to the system. So if we, if we want to take all three, four of these words, substitutes the 21st century definition for what these could possibly mean and it looks like these are the case and substitute it in that same verse, we come up with an interesting verse. Let me, let me paraphrase mm -hmm. the same verse, Revelation 13, 15. And it was made given to him, the Antichrist, the intelligence and function of an image or device which connects to the financial system and the connecting function would communicate in a language unintelligible to the user 
and might cause those who do not have unquestioning alliance to the financial system to be killed. It's interesting. And He's all of the above, the system. yeah, the system is what everybody's talking about now. Everybody's talking about multi-billionaires, trillionaires, uh, and, and they're getting together on a worldwide basis and developing a, a, a uh, web, a communications web, yeah. which is now salted with artificial intelligence. It's a reality. It's not just future anymore. Uh, I, I am, I'm given to understand that artificial intelligence is, is now controlling a lot of the communications that, that, that we're using on a daily basis. Yeah. And uh, everybody thinks that's a wonderful thing. And, but it scares me, quite frankly. Yeah, it actually scares us too. It, 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 the reason why this scares us so much is because this sentence read the way John, I truly believe, is referencing it is the genesis of a system that would ultimately be the confirmation and delivery system for the actual mark of the beast. So what are we talking about? What does this most clearly and closely connect to that we have in the 21st century? Smart devices. And what everybody's got one. Yeah, what, is, what do smart devices do? They connect us to our, besides everything else we do with them, they connect us to our money, debit cards, Credit cards and smart devices connect us to our money. The world is rapidly moving away from a cash model to a, uh, a digital system. Cash is going away, and it will eventually go away completely. So that, as Revelation tells us in the end, you will not be able to buy or sell unless you belong to the system. Well, it's not going to be a new system. Mm -hmm. It's here. It's here right now. Actually, the thing you're holding in your right hand right now, if you pass that over the right device, it will, it, it'll pay your bill when, oh. you, when you go to a store. Absolutely. I use Apple Pay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all the Antichrist has to do is to say, you cannot access your own bank account and access your own money by whatever means you do, mm -hmm. debit card, credit card, smart device, unless you belong to this, what I'll refer to as the New World Order. In other words, unless you give unquestioning alliance mm -hmm. to what we're trying to accomplish. And of course, everybody will do that. Why? Mm -hmm. This is the smartest man in the world. He's come to save all of this. He's going to create sustainability. He will remove hunger and disease, and he's going to bring in utopia on earth, and he's going to give us the promise of peace and safety. Why wouldn't I want to cooperate with that? Why would I want to fight against that? So of course, I will agree and join the program. Um, interesting thing here, and this is what scares us. I, I alluded to it, but I didn't say it. If we read the very first few words of that verse, and it was made given to him, mm -hmm. the Antichrist. It can't be given to him, this entire system, unless it already exists. Mm. And it does exist. It's being created right now, mm -hmm. and it's, being, it's moving around the world. This system has been in the works for several decades. Remember when the Antichrist confirms a treaty at the starting of the last seven years? Mm -hmm. He didn't negotiate the treaty. He didn't write the treaty. He didn't sign the treaty. The treaty was already signed, negotiated, and all parties agreed upon it. Israel, the Arabs, everyone. So the, it's already laid out for him. He just confirms the treaty and enforces it. The same thing is true here. This system is already in place. He, for some reason, is given control of the entire financial system of the world and he then dictates no one will buy or sell unless they have unquestioning alliance to my plan for the world and everybody will fall in place. Gives me a lot to think about and the, the, the fascinating part of all this is that when you dig deep in the language and, and Greek is a very deep language. I, I've studied Greek for many years going back to college. And the thing I noticed at first about the Greek language is that you can be very specific. I mean, you can speak in such a way that n nobody can mistake what you're saying because it's very inflected and very uh, subtle. 
with the endings and the prefixes and all of the little complexities of the language, you can be extraordinarily specific in, in the Greek language. You sort of lose that in English, but you've brought it back again in the pure word, which uh, is a lot of work. Right. I, I, I mean, uh, that, that was uh, why you undertook that uh, is an amazing story, because uh, who, would, who would set out to do such a complicated and difficult thing as you did? I, that, that question kind of rings in my mind right now. Yeah, well, we, uh, we looked at all the churches decades ago, and all the fights and all the discrepancies and all the divisions seem to be based on the arguing over various English translations. Mm -hmm. Very few people ever refer to the original Greek. And when they refer to the original Greek, they weren't referring to the original definitions or the changes in our own language over time. Mm -hmm. So in order to fix the problem, as the short video uh, you played earlier showed, mm -hmm. we had to go right to the very beginning. Yeah, the four uh, words for the, for the single English word love, uh, that says it all. And by the way, God is love. And, and there's only one book in the world that uses that little three-word sentence. And you need to understand all about what love is. It's called the pure word. Uh, this is a beautiful leather-bound edition that I'm holding here. And we're offering it to you for $85. Now, I also have a, a paperback version. This is identical, except yes. that it's paperback. The, the, uh, the contents, the layout is, is just exactly the same. Uh, so we have this uh, for you for uh, $50, your gift to Prophecy Watchers, along with uh, whether you order the, the uh, leather-bound or the paper-bound version, we have a, a couple of presentations made at our recent Blessed Hope Prophecy Forum. Uh, by Brent, and uh, we're going to give you these free uh, with your purchase. By the way, f we have free shipping uh, anywhere in the United States uh, for our books and DVDs, and you just go to prophecywatchers.com and uh, you just scroll down. Uh, you know, the first thing you'll see at the top of the screen is our uh, library. You click that, you scroll down, you find Brent Miller's name, you'll find the pure word. Uh, you'll find this offer, and uh, we hope that you do uh, avail yourself of Brent Miller's uh, work, long work. How long did it take you to do this? A uh, little over 22 years in total. Wow. Yes. <laughs> and, and you're going to be amazed, you're going to be challenged, I guarantee you. Uh, Brent, this is uh, a, a wonderful conversation. I love talking about the Bible, and I know you do too. Yeah, very much so. And speaking of end times technologies, um, we have come across one other bit of information by looking at the new translation that is even scarier than what we've been talking about today. Well, maybe we'll talk about that on our next broadcast. Time. Brent Miller, Sr. Oh, he's uh, done a great work. I'm Gary Stearman. Hey, you keep watching. We are... Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter or follow us at facebook.com slash prophecywatchers. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.